Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is October the 14th, 2018. Our guest today is Brian Hodge. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Good. Representing the state of Colorado with plenty of flannel today. So. <laughs> it's snowing there today. It's winter out. Yeah, we got about 10 inches of snow overnight. Oh, wow. I'm pretty jealous. It's almost 80 here. <laughs> But uh, it's supposed to be the high is supposed to be fifty tomorrow, so that's a you know thirty yeah. degree drop. Yeah. So I assume that's Hurricane Michael. Um, all right. Well, let's do introductions and then uh, talk to Brian. Uh, why don't we start with you, Matt? Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I've edited a few books for Ulthar Press, and I just had a blast at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival with Kelly Young. Awesome, uh, Rick. Uh, Rick Lay, writer. Kelly. Kelly Young, uh, executive editor, Strange Eons Magazine. I have zero recollection of the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. It's not surprising. <laughs> you have to be sober to have at least some recommend. I, I drank a lot with Philip Fricasse. Wow. And when you say a lot, it's really a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, ben. Uh, I'm Ben Handelman. Uh, I'm here so Kelly doesn't have to drink alone. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and I'm Mike Davis. Um, Brian, uh, if for those out there who maybe don't know who you are, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, That's sober. Good. Yeah, sober. Yeah, uh, you can only go downhill from here. Um, <laughs> God, I, I, I've lost track now. There are enough of them that I've lost track of, of, of the exact number. Somewhere around 14 or 15 novels out that I've published. And the uh, uh, fifth collection is coming out uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, been I've been writing full-time for, for decades now uh, through various ups and downs. Um, that... Um, Got about I, I think I'm, I'm up to about 130 short works, you know, and some some being short works as many as about, as about 38,000 words. So uh, that's that's my uh, that's my mission in life. Uh, you're creeping up on Stephen King numbers, aren't you? Um, I think it's I think you'd have to add a zero to all of those. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, what's this I saw on Facebook today when you posted about the podcast? You mm -hmm. said we might discuss coping strategies for when your whole year derails. Oh, well, you know, I didn't know that, that, um, you know, I didn't know if you'd want to, you want to get into, like I was saying before the, uh, um, before we went live here, the, uh, I had a lot of plans this year that, uh, that just got, got pushed back because in, um, um, April, I lost lost both parents 23 days apart. And, oh, uh, that's right. That's what you were referring yeah, to. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. I thought it was. Oh, no. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. I, I know what, yeah, the year falling apart can be yeah, for my, different reasons. In, in mid -my, yeah, I had a lot of momentum going into the year when it was, it was uh, it really, um, it really had a, a number of things moving forward. And then um, in mid, um, mid March, my, um, my mom decided it was time that uh, my dad really needed to go into a memory care unit. So dropped everything and, um, and went to see to that. And then on his, I think 16th or 17th day there, he, he suddenly died, um, got, uh, dropped everything, went, uh, went on another, an another trip there. Each time it's like a thousand miles there and a thousand miles back. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I ended up going back and forth about uh, yeah, six times in, in seven weeks. Um, um, so, yeah, 23 days then after my dad died, my mom died. Uh, none of the, neither of the deaths were expected. So my mom died on the, uh, um, the same day that uh, The Immaculate Void was published. So the, the publication okay. day of that, that's, that's the news that I woke up to. I... Um, woke up um i get up about 5 30 and then i usually like to head outside and do some sort of do a run or jump rope or something like that some sort of cardio so um 
usually where you know where I live, it's it's almost uh, throughout the year. You have to check the what the I, I always check the weather app first thing when I get up and see how many layers to put on. Um, and then I uh, got the phone and and looked at that. Okay, oh, it's five thirty in the morning. I've missed uh, I've missed five calls. Uh, oh man! In, in the last hour, and they're all. Uh, they're all from my hometown. This can only be one thing. Um, so I knew before I even looked at the, uh, um, I checked the voicemail. To what well, I knew what it had to be. And um, but you know, even even in the middle of that, there's this. Well, comedy isn't the right word. I guess this level of absurdity coming through because I, um, you know, the phone has this uh, this visual voicemail thing where it transcribes or attempts to transcribe, and so I'm looking at that. And, just to kind of verify that uh, that my worst suspicions of uh, really are, and I'm, the first thing I see is uh, we couldn't revise your mother, so we couldn't. And <laughs> I, you can't revise it. Oh, you you mean revive? Okay. So. I'm awfully sorry to hear well, about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. So it's yeah. When these been, really big personal things happen, it really. You've got momentum built up, and then it just your yeah. derails you. Yeah, every time that I went, uh, I got back here and got back to work again, and uh, kind of got some equilibrium. Something worse would happen, and then um, then after that, I was appointed executor of their estate, and that's that's uh, there's a lot to do in that. They they left some messes to clean up, and then there's the normal the normal stuff. So still not uh, I'm still not clear of it yet. So I yeah. Uh, I, I have yet to to write a word since uh, since the day before my mom died. Well, that's understandable. Yeah. Well, part of it is just having to. Um, yeah, you go through so much in a, in such a short time, and then um, there are all these then responsibilities on top of that. So it's just emotionally and uh, mentally exhausting on top of the time the the, the time suck that it turns into. So I'm. Uh, I think I'm on the downhill slope of things right now, but uh, but still not still not clear of it yet. Well, on happier topics, a um, <laughs> couple of your stories you said before we went live are, are being taught right now. Yeah, there's um, uh, there's someone I'm Facebook friends with um, named Richard Thomas who has a class that I think he's been teaching a lot of stuff out of. Um, uh, a recent year's best edition of Ellen Datlow's, and it just happened that that year, um, Ellen picked two uh, two pieces of mine um, on these blackened shores of time, and it's all the same road in the end. She picked both of them for that that particular edition, and so um, that's so th those are part of the curriculum, I guess. That uh, in in his class, could you give a brief synopsis of on the blackened roads of time? I, I I've read it, but I don't. It's not uh, jogging my memory right this second. Okay, on these blackened sh shores of time, or it's all the same road. These blackened shores of time. Uh, uh, let me throw okay, yeah, both because, yeah, I think Matt, you're a big fan of both stories, right? Yes. Uh, blackened shores of time. That's um, narrated by uh, by a former FBI agent who um, watches as his son drives up on their. Um, on their street, um, and the street opens up, and uh, the, the the son's car drops into a hole. Of what's uh, what's uh, they come to find out is a a mine shaft that was closed very shoddily about tw about a uh, hundred years before in the 1920s. And um, even when he gets over there, there's no sign of the car. So that's uh, no no sign of what happened to him. So that's. Uh, there's a lot more truth uh, truth behind that when we did really have a flood here that washed out a mine shaft in front of a friend's house uh, five years ago and about 14 15 16 months after the uh, after the floods that we had here what was called a considered a thousand year flood uh, one of his neighbors was driving by and the street opened up and swallowed the car so um, for the very reasons that uh, um, that I give in the story that um, Somebody in the 1920s closed a mine and did a really shitty job of it. They just kind of chucked a bunch of debris in the hole and tarps and dirt and things like that. And then, uh, so the whole neighborhood neighborhood had no idea that they were that they were built over 
built over an old mine. Uh, you know, just to nobody had any fact, it's, it's amazing how something that somebody did almost 100 years ago can affect someone's life today just because of them not doing as good of a job as they should have. Yeah, so that uh, that appealed to me uh, for the for the kind of story I wanted to write. You got the present present tense, then you've got the, and, and that's really part of the introduction there to the story that you've got the uh, the present tense stuff, and then what happened a uh, hundred years ago to set it in motion, and then beyond that into into millions of years ago as, as to what's down there. Um, so that was. That's on these blackened shores of time. On the so you wanted you wanted to know the you know, both of them or just the one? Yeah, both, please. Uh, both of them. Um, it's all the same road in the end. Um, well, again, the, it's it's past the near past impinging on the present. Um, it's uh, two brothers from West Virginia who um, wh whose mo their mom is is terminal. Um, so before. Before she dies, they have spent years trying to find out what happened to her father, their grandfather, who disappeared 50-odd years ago, but who had um, little clues left behind. And he, he was essentially a song catcher. He liked to go out and, and record indigenous uh, regional traditions of music. And um, so there's a, a final recording that he left behind and a, a final picture shot, behind, shot on on. Uh, uh, left behind on on a camera, so both uh, both the recording and camera were uh, were recovered, and so they've been they've been trying to find what happened to him ever since, and they they finally do. Where where can we find both of those short stories? Uh, let's see, it's all the same road in the end. That was originally written for in um, uh, the Mammoth Book of Cthulhu that uh, that Paula Garan edited, and then. Um, the other one that was originally written for Ellen Datlow's uh, Children of Lovecraft anthology, and then she picked both of them for, um, I forget which numbered edition it was, but it was, it was a couple ago for the uh, year's best, or best horror of the year. Uh, well, if someone who hasn't read your work asks you, hey, Brian, what kind of fiction do you write? What... What, what would you say to them? What, what would be your response? Oh, <laughs> speculative <laughs> usually, you know, it, it, uh, speculative uh, it, it falls under a, uh, under a broad, uh, uh, probably under the broadest umbrella um, because I've, I've done some things here in the past year and a half or so that are really more fantasy oriented and uh, I'm getting more interested in that. But some of it is, some of it is, is, is quieter horror. Some of it is uh, wetter horror, and <laughs> um, so that. But that doesn't include the crime stuff that I that I've done. The, the, there were two crime novels. So um, did a Hellboy novel um, probably about ten years ago. I got hired to do that. And, yeah. um, so a good short answer. A lot everything. of everything. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I like. I think it was a it was a long time ago that I read an interview with Tom Waits, and I like the way he he phrased what he did because he kept finding different voices he could use and he could get different kinds of music that he was interested in doing beyond the original kind of barroom sounding stuff, and um, and so he never felt like he was lev leaving anything behind. He just envisioned that his concentric circles that kept widening and encompassing what he did, and so I've. Uh, I really like that answer when I read it, and that uh, it, it feels that feels apt. Yeah, like life is a flat circle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what I like is, um, you know, of course you've read Lovecraft and kind of dabbled your toes in it, but you're not a, I would say, a, a Lovecraftian author because that's, you know, that's too limiting. Do you know what I mm -hmm. mean? Yeah. Like different aspects of weird and apocalyptic horror. But for the people listening to this podcast who are Lovecraft fans, I have to say that the same deep waters as you is a wonderful meditation uh, on the deep ones. Well, I re yeah, I re really enjoyed that one. I mean, that was that was definitely for uh, for a Lovecraft. Yeah, that was written for the last of uh, or the third of, of editor Stephen Jones's Innsmouth trilogy. 
uh, of anthology. So that that really had to have all kinds of connections there. But, but what I liked about it was, um, okay, I've seen one author where uh, she disliked the fact that uh, the people of Innsmouth were rounded up and put into concentration camps like uh, an oppressed minority like the mm. Japanese were interred. Yeah. And so she's taken off on this whole thing where they're, they're really just nature children almost. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look at uh, Brian McNaughton, he did the doom that came to Innsmouth. And frankly, they're just, they're the horrible monsters that Lovecraft made them out to be, but they put a veneer of civility on it uh, to say that they're repressed and not being allowed to practice their religion. So what you do is something even different, which is they're just completely alien. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to actually communicate with them is extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. I really like that aspect of it. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you know it's been optioned for a TV series? No, no, great, 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 great. Yeah. Uh, what's the deal? The details, details. Yeah, I, um, I was sitting on the news for a long time, and I, I was able to speak publicly about it toward the beginning of the year. But um, it's a production company in London uh, called Three River, and they um, saw it, uh, again, in one of Ellen Datlow's anthologies. I think it was Lovecraft's Monsters is where they saw it, because it was published and, and printed and reprinted about four times in a year. Um, so, but I think that's where they found it. But um, it's the same people... I'd be surprised if you didn't see this because if, uh, as it was all over my Facebook feed for a long time, it was uh, about a two minute teaser of a thing that they did that integrated um, like HG Wells, uh, War of the Worlds kinds of machines in uh, Martian machines in vintage World War I footage. So did you see that? Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same people that did that. I mean, that was. That t a lot of people think that they think that's all there was to it, but no, it was a full uh, mockumentary that, that they did. That was uh, that they did for the BBC, I think it was. That uh, it was a full, full um, hour, hour and forty minutes, I think. But it was a full feature length thing that they did that was really well done. So I'm, um, you know, I'm optimistic that if they get something rolling with it, that uh, it's going to be it's going to be well done. Right now, they. Uh, um, I guess they're still interviewing for showrunner and head writer or something like that. But um, that's uh, so that's where things stand now. Well, congratulations! It's Thanks. A great story, and I th think a lot of other people think so too. I mean, how many times has it been reprinted now? Well, four, four or five. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, speaking of Lovecraftian and or cosmic horror. This was just published, The Immaculate Void, mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, right? Yeah, uh, April April 24th. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, do you want to talk about the plot to this or give a synopsis? Tell us about what the book is about. Well, it's... Um, I really liked it, by the way. You're, yeah, I, well, I was sent a copy and read it in just a couple of sittings. Yeah. Well, it's about um, again. It's about trying to find out what's happened to somebody who's who's turned up missing. Um, the but the point of view really alternates continually between the person who's missing and the uh, uh, her brother, who's who's actually the one looking for her. Um, um, but she was, as a child, she was uh, came within seconds of being killed uh, by a uh, a neighbor down to the street who. Uh, uh, that wasn't his first, you know, she was, uh, several, um, kidnappings into it, uh, as, as far as, uh, you know, what there, or she was, you know, one of the, one of his, um, intended victims, I guess, with, with number nine or 10 and, um, was caught finally, uh, right, right before he was, he was going to finish dispatching with her when she was about five or six years old. Um, but, um, you know, something happened to her during that experience that really put her in touch with something beyond the everyday. And that's kind of been dogging her, uh, ever since as she's tried to make sense of the experience and try to get past the experience. And, um, 
but on another level, she's still a mess from it um, and has been prone to making bad decisions and disappearing uh, at different times in her life. And, um, and because her older brother was the one who essentially left her alone uh, to be snatched up like this, he's been working off a lifetime of guilt to try to, uh, to try to do that and get that taken care of and, and try to just expunge that guilt. But it, um, it just gradually opens up into, uh, into a whole theory of, of how the universe actually works and what she's really in touch with. Um, that's, yeah, I yeah, like that's, it, that's it, the it, best. I, yeah, I, I, but you know, I, it's like I wanted to play with some really big, grand ideas, but I figured the best way to get into that is to start very small and intimate. Right. Well, that's one of the things about your stories is uh, the people come across as real. Do, do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They're, mm -hmm. The what happens to the people is important. You end up caring about the characters, so it's not just um, some kind of distant narrative yeah well, that's what i've always focused on yeah, that, yeah starting at the very beginning with the very first stuff i really try to have a focus on on bringing you into the characters or, or bringing them across to to you because if you go if you if you zoom too far out you know it's like well what happens in this spiral arm of our galaxy is not going to make a whole hell of a lot of difference to people in the Andromeda galaxy who no. don't give a crap, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. but it, on the other hand, it's like what happens to people is important, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's how people define their lives is through relationships and uh, friends and family. And, and so then what makes the story interesting to the reader is what's happening to the people in this context of something uh, very indifferent cosmically that's happening mm -hmm. uh i was sent this before it was published so i think it's been at least six or eight months since i've read it um and there's this uh concept that you play around with that's really stuck with me i'll find myself thinking about it at odd times mm -hmm. and not quite remembering where it came from that i remember <laughs> it, immaculate void you yeah. know um and i I'll, I just want to read a little pa uh, small passage from the book because this encapsulates the uh, concept. Uh, someday in a million years or a billion or so far from now, there's not even a number for it in this version of the universe or the next one to come or another one after that. These particles that used to be you, they'll end up together again. Against trillion to one odds, they'll find each other again. They probably won't look like you anymore. They'll be stirred into something totally different. But deep down inside, something in them will recognize each other and will connect back to before, to now, and they'll have memories of what they used to be together. They'll remember being you. Part of them will want to be you again, and whatever it is they become, that's going to make that living being think it's crazy. So, you know, I have no idea how you came up with that, but I, it was one of the most interesting parts of the book for me. Well, it um, it was just something that I gradually started to, to piece together it was, as I was developing the basic ideas from it. Um, and part of, uh, really one of the earliest impetuses in, in writing it was to kind of deal with uh, what felt like an uneasy sort of uh, conflict that I had within, within my, well, not, not necessarily um, within myself, but it just seemed like an odd, um, an odd juxtaposition in that, uh, in that I, I really find it interesting to tell stories like this to, and to write, uh, to, to write in this vein. And, uh, I think it's extremely rich, uh, but, you know, you go, you go to Lovecraft or Ligotti or some and, and other people that I, that I've seen that, uh, Either are enthusiasts of of, of, uh, of cosmic horror or or, or, or writers who and, um, who do it, and they really subscribe to that view of the universe as ho as hostile and meaningless or, or mean and or meaningless um, of uh, of human life as being meaningless, um, existence having no um, you know having really no va no value. Um, 
And I've never felt like that. It's fun to work as if, but so I, I, I kind of wanted to address that, that abrading sense that I, that I felt. Um, so I got to thinking about meaning, the meaning of, 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 of a person's life and existence and um, playing out across such a vast time scale that even, even the age of the universe is just a blip. Uh, the age of our universe is just a blip. So I started thinking about um, what kind of mechanism would would enable that. What would uh, what would trigger it? What would uh, what would hit the reset button all over again? And um, so that was that was how I started to come, coming up with those concepts. Um, and I hadn't really seen them before. Maybe somebody has, has played around with something like that before, but. Um, it was it was certainly certainly new to me, and it's something that I hadn't really considered before. in in, in these in all these particular terms, aspects of it, yeah, the uh, the idea of the universe contracting and expanding um, as as sure. though it were very you know billion years of billion year breaths of, uh, and exhalations. But um, but that was that was. Um, just kind of where I followed when uh, when I started the, the the brainstorming process. Yeah, it, it may be out there somewhere, but if it has, I don't I don't recall it. It mm -hmm. it really stuck with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I got I have to say uh, for anyone listening who's a fan of cosmic horror, which I assume would be everybody, <laughs> uh, the Immaculate Void by Brian Hodge. I definitely recommend you pick it up. It's uh, available for print and for Kindle, in print and for Kindle. Um, also, another, it's a novella, not a novel, right? Whom the Gods Would Destroy? Whom the Gods Would Destroy, yeah, that's um, 33,000 words, so it's a novella. Yeah, it, it came out several years ago. I also enjoyed that one. I think we talked about that one on the podcast mm. yeah. about that time. Um, you know, I was looking for it again today. Uh, is it out of print? Well, yeah, that's um, because Dark Fuse, that was done through Dark Fuse, and they, um, right. they declared bankruptcy uh, quite, I guess it was last year, maybe. So, yeah, everything of theirs disappeared, and that was another thing that, uh, uh, is, it, with the year's plans that just got pushed back, I was going to take all that, all the stuff that I uh, had with them and got the rights back to, and uh, another thing that I was going to, uh, I got a reissue on um, another one or two. So I was going to put these things out about one a month. Yeah. And um, it was uh, doing all the work behind the scenes and, and getting covers made and um, formatting them for, uh, for, for Kindle and uh, kind of putting them under my own, uh, my own publishing imprint. Cause I wanted to try that out and see what it was like. Uh, self-publishing something because all these things they, they I, I consider them that they've paid for their keep so I can experiment with them right. um, and put them out and then like you know like we were talking about everything just got put on hold was it so the next several months you know should finally see these things start to come out again well it's great to hear that that's gonna be out there again because it's a it's a good story really great story I really enjoyed it great cosmic horror story um, was that available from them in Kindle format too, or just print? Yeah, Kindle, man, Kindle mainly. Um, then they would put out those little books, um, those cute little, cute little books that uh, hard covers that were, uh, but they were almost like these little miniatures. Um, but yeah, it was primarily. Um, well, our, our friend Pete Rollick, who's usually a panelist on the show, and he said he'd be late, so he might be on later, but. He said his problem with Kindle is, and I like Kindle and I like print, so I don't really have an agenda here. But he said his problem with Kindle is what happens when the publisher goes out of out of business? Mm -hmm. you know, what happens to those Kindle books? Yeah, and yeah, they disappear. Yeah, you know, my response is, well, you know, why would you stop collecting royalties? Um, you know, you don't have to put out any more books. Uh, but yeah, I guess if it's bankrupt, and here I'm thinking, okay, I paid for whom the gods would destroy, you know, for Kindle, and it's gone, which is, 
Yeah, I, I searched for it in my Kindle today, and I couldn't find it. So, really? Yeah. I didn't know that they things like that disappeared. Uh, well, I won't say that I do know. Maybe uh, I didn't search well enough or anything, but it it I I think I did. And uh, if anyone else out there has a um, Kindle copy of Whom the Gods Would Destroy, um, I'd appreciate it if they emailed me, and because I'm really I'd like to know the answer to this question. Uh, Lovecraft Ezine at gmail.com. But yeah, I searched for it today. I couldn't find it. Uh, I'm not berating you. Not your fault. No. <laughs> you, you you were, you know, you you were, you didn't want it to happen either. The, no. It's in the hands of the publisher. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So. Well, I, I, I can send, I can send you a copy. Well, yeah. The, uh, I wasn't fishing for that. I was just <laughs> sort of my question. I, I mean, I never turned down a signed Brian Hodge book by any means, but well, I can't sign the Kindle edition, so no, I've only no, got... no. You, you have to send me a leather-bound print edition. The, uh, those don't <laughs> exist, actually. <laughs> um, Some yeah, other so universe. Have, but I'm, I'm glad to hear it's going to come back out mm. and be reprinted. So, yeah. um, let's see here. Um, you have a soundtrack. Speaking of whom, the gods would destroy you have a soundtrack that you created for that book um yeah. you're a musician as well yeah. yeah all that equipment behind you there uh the soundtrack is going to be released later this year too right you want to well, i did about it that? i did it at the time yeah you, you said you remastered it before yeah, the show started. And remastered it i've set, set up, up new i'm hearing an echo now oh are you Still. yeah and I don't know. I don't no, hear an echo. I think, so I, I think that cleared it out. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I did it at the time and, and made it available just for free download, just as a kind of a. Uh, it wasn't anything that I planned while I was doing the, uh, while I was while I was doing the writing, but um, just because of uh, of the the heavy influence on, on uh, uh, or, or the heavy thematic influence of space on the. Uh, in that I, I listened to a lot of space music while I was writing it rather than um, you know maybe the more minimalist dark ambient kind of stuff or Steve Roach stuff that I listen to while I'm while I'm while I'm normally writing so maybe for those reasons I started relating to the book or, or, the, or the story sonically in a way that I didn't before and I thought well it'd be interesting to to maybe do an EP's worth of stuff, maybe four tracks of, uh, of, of musical impressions that uh, from that so but I, and the, but it ended up being um close to 40 minutes and, and 10 tracks um but uh my my production skills have gotten better since then and so i um so one thing that i did this year because i just really wasn't there's was, there was just more immediate uh, gratification in remixing and remastering that and that was about all i had the uh the uh the mental and emotional energy to do you know, this summer um while going through the executor duties and things like that and so I, so that yeah that's what i did it and yeah you know, i can a b things i can compare them to commercial releases and think okay this is in the ballpark now um sounds like the a blanket's been taken off the speakers and um so yeah i've, I've got that ready to ready to put up again for free download again and um but i'm gonna try to you know, at least make it coincide with uh with with putting the putting the the story itself back out there again. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, getting them out about the same time. Uh, for listeners who you know uh, would like to know, what are some of your other uh, Lovecraftian stories that they can they can f find out there? You know, not, well, the, yeah, you know, there's that, and there's, um, I guess the. The, the very first thing I uh, that I did along those lines was for John Palin. Um, I, did, I think it was Children of Cthulhu was that. Because you know, I get that in the Ellen Datlow anthology mixed up, the titles mixed up, Children of Lovecraft, Children of Cthulhu. But yeah, that was called, that was a thing called the Firebrand Symphony. And it was uh, just uh, kind of the first venture into, into that as far as, you know, strange hidden races and, and, and that sort of thing um 
really one of the ones that, that, I, that I'm most proud of is going to be in that batch of, uh, of re-released stuff. It was something that I did with, um, um, it, it, it was kind of like a, a book of novellas, and I, I got half of it, and Gerard Harnard had uh, got the other half of it, uh, but it was called, um, oh, I'm blanking on the title, um, something city, dark city, something like that. But it was a thing I, I, that I do called in the uh, in the negative spaces. Um, but I, I'd like to I'd like to reissue that again. I was really proud of that one. That was about thirty five thousand words. That was set in a uh, in a skyscraper in New um, in New York that has uh, uh, kind of the top floors are are in another dimension periodically. So, um, so there's yeah there's that. Um, in let's see ellen's uh best of the best this was a, from a few years ago that i did for shadows over main street anthology um i had a had a piece in that um that um that you know, i really like I, I immediately liked the uh the concept of the anthology it was uh basically lovecraft they, they couldn't use the term mayberry but uh what they wanted was uh, was, was shadows over Mayberry, and I uh, couldn't use that, but it was a um, for this kind of uh, um, idyllic '50s small town golden era kind of thing. Although you could fudge on it and um, right. put it uh, put it in a in a more recent time frame, but still this kind of uh, golden age Americana. So I had a piece in that. Um, yeah, those are. I should have had a list prepared. Uh, that's fine. Uh, just off the top of your head, that's that's yeah. fine. Um, so you wrote a Hellboy novel some time ago. Uh, yeah. Talk about that a bit. Yeah, um, I had uh, done a few years before that. I had done, it was for the very first Hellboy anthology that Dark Horse Comics put together. It was called Odd Jobs, and so I was. Um, at the time, at least, uh, Chris, Christopher Golden, who worked uh, both, uh, I guess, both in comics and, and in, in writing novels and things like that, he was kind of Mike Mignola's go-between uh, to the prose world. And so um, Chris asked me if I would want to do a, a Hellboy story for that. And so I was... At the time, I hadn't really read him. I was just familiar with the covers, and I was one of those people that thought he was wearing red goggles, and you know, because of the sawed off <laughs> horn stumps. Apparently, that's a common misconception if you don't know the character, and I was one of them. But they sent me a bunch of stuff, and um, I really, it really clicked with me. And so, whenever I try to, whenever I, I call it playing in somebody else's yard. Um, so whenever I'm invited to come play in somebody else's yard, I try to meet them as, uh, as I look for the overlap in our interests, basically. So um, so they'll be happy with it, and I'll have fun doing it, and, and it'll feel very natural to me. And I noticed that how um, into folklore that uh, and, and like British Isles history and um, mythology that Mike was, um, a lot of things in, in what they sent me hinged on that. And so I thought, well, I'll do something that um, that involves the Beowulf character of Grendel, and so it involved a reborn Grendel, and um, it after after it came out, um, I didn't find out for a while, but it, it turned out to be one of Mike's favorite of anybody else's uses of his character. Oh, that's a huge compliment. It was. It that's was. Great. It really was. That was that was what what got back to me. That um, so when um, around the time that the first movie came out. He sold four, uh, sold four novels to Simon and Schuster, Pocket Books. Um, now, of course, they needed people to write them, and Chris was going to do one. But uh, Chris was in charge of uh, really finding the other three authors, and so I was short. Based on that short story, I was um, shortlisted um, for an invitation to uh, to do one of the novels, and I had about a weekend to come up with a premise. Um, and so what I did was I um, long, long time ago, um, 
when uh, when Glenn Danzig was was bouncing tracks at uh, Verotic Comics, I had I had written a script for for them for one of their one of their in-house characters, and it involved a uh, a kind of a rival hell. So that was what the uh, that was the idea that I tapped onto um, the the construction of a rival hell, a different dimension, and um, and it wasn't. Yeah, we tweaked the idea a little bit so um, it wouldn't step on Mike's toes and what he was planning for doing in the uh, in, in the future with the comics. But uh, but it ended up being uh, being really well received by fans, as far as I, as far as, as far as I'm aware of, uh, except for one guy who was who, who was really unhappy with Am with uh, on Amazon because because it didn't have any Mike Mignola drawings in it. Oh yes, I was actually looking at the reviews of it today, as really? a matter of fact, and saw that nice <laughs> dumbass review. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, yeah. I want I, I I have a policy of not responding to to bad reviews. That's a good policy, and because I just don't want to put that energy out there or, or, and, and to perpetuate any kind of anything like that and you never look good when you do it. But I thought, okay, I did want to answer my. I did want to say, you know. It may not have come with Mike Mignola's drawings, but you know what it did come with? Mike's blessing. <laughs> and he liked it a lot. <laughs> You'd like to be able to say that too. Yeah. Uh, what are the some of the biggest influences on your uh, on your writing? Mm. Well, early on, um, I would I would have to say that, that that Stephen King he throws such a huge shadow you really can't get out from underneath it. Um, um, and, and that was certainly the case. Lovecraft, yeah, uh, a huge influence. Probably more, uh, probably more now. Um, you know, in, in the past decade than than early on. Um, a, there are a lot of things that I learned from crime fiction, uh, especially Elmore Leonard. I really liked the way he could pare things down, but still get across so much that uh, that. Uh, he was he was very educational, um, and then almost the uh, the extreme opposite of that, as far as minimalism and maximalism. John Irving, I love John Irving stuff. Um, and then, as a uh, after starting to get things out and and start publishing and meeting other writers that were coming along and about the same time, I uh, I thought um, that I was getting a lot. You know, I was. Uh, a big admirer uh, got the, immediately a big admirer of uh, Kathy Koja and oh yeah um, Pop Easy Bright and um, Caitlin Kiernan. Uh, all of them were doing really really nice things with really interesting things with language and uh, and so that was uh, you know I learned from them as well so. Um, you know that's that's always that's never a thing you can answer. Feel like you you've answered fully. That's right. Yeah, there's always it's somebody a, that you. It's always with. a scratching the surface kind of thing, and then. What uh, what is it about Lovecraftian horror, and cosmic horror that appeals to you? It's the biggest canvas I think to play on. Um, that's that's one thing. I, I and I one thing that I've always responded to. Um, that was such a such appealing was it was it was surely the depth of his imagination, and not uh, not his characterizations or anything like that, or or, or, or even the uh, a, a human connection because that just wasn't a strong suit. So he played to it played to the strength of his imagination um, and just the uh, the idea of deep time, um, the all the layers of history and um, unburied history that, that can arise out of um, uh, this uh, kind of crazed exploration into something. Um, the, the tendency of these other dimensions to impinge on this reality, all of that was just really, really f fertile stuff that I didn't even feel really capable of, of tackling for quite a while. Uh, or, or that I could at least do it justice, and I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to mimic. 
I, I wanted to tell the kind of stories that, that felt like they were, they were coming, still coming from me without, without necessarily uh, trying to do an imitation. But it's, right. uh, like I said, it's, it's the biggest canvas to play on. Uh, I read in an interview, uh, I forget who it was with, I'm sorry, but um, you said that if you could experience one novel all over again for the first time, it was Peter Straub's uh, Shadowland. Okay. Yeah. I've, you know, I've read some of his work, obviously, but I don't, I don't think I've ever read that one. Can you talk about that book and why you would want to experience it again? Um, yeah, I don't even... I don't even remember where that would have been. I, I, I you know, I, <laughs> I just I snatched it out of your mind. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you're commended for your excavation skills here. Um, well, I remembered when I, you know, it's one of those where you where you not only remember reading the book, reading the novel again, and of course he was writing really thick, meaty novels at the time. Um, I think he's, you know, in, in more recent times, he's tried to pare, pare, pare some down. But um, it was one of those things where you, situations where you remember not just reading the novel, but you remember the experience of reading the novel. You can picture yourself in a particular room. You remember what was going on at, uh, at particular times. And I read it. And when I read it, it was, it was during my senior year in college. Um, so I just remember that really, that, that autumn really... Um, really vividly is being associated with that novel and I just lost myself in it for I don't know a week or 10 days or whatever and it was just uh, you know there was this dark fairy tale quality to it and but at the same time it was grounded in these things that that, that um that seemed it seems like there was a boys school too uh that uh, that was that was part of one of the characters backgrounds and um, so people that he had met there and how they, and how they, lived. yeah, it's been a long time. I never read it again. Um, I should, but, uh, but so being in, uh, you know, being, being away at, at school and, and that was a, that was a point of connection. I don't know. It was just one of those things that, that where everything lined up as far as, uh, inner and outer worlds, uh, inner and outer experiences. That just made the novel so resonant and so mesmerizing for me during that time, and it was, uh, um, it was just a kind of a magic that doesn't doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't ha happen with when e where everything just gels temporally so perfectly. Well, I keep getting friendly accusations from listeners that every week I'm adding to their list of books they have to buy and, and or books that they have to read. So, Shame I, on you. you know, I'm going to keep playing to this. And if Brian Hodge says this this book is, is awesome, then here's another book for them to check out. And I'm actually going to check it out myself. So. Yeah, well, it was the next one he did after Ghost Story. So everybody seems to be at least have a have maybe a greater familiarity with Ghost Story. But um, yeah, I really, I, which I love too, but there was just something about uh, the novel and the time I read it that like I said it's it's just some kind of a magic thing that, that you get every now and then well and then I noticed also uh, that you were a part of a project from Crystal Lake publishing mm -hmm. uh, and they're offering this book I don't remember how long I don't I mean I'm sorry I don't know how long it, it ago it was published you can probably tell me but uh, it's called writers on writing and author's mm -hmm. guide um, yeah. And they're selling this book for Kindle for zero dollars and zero cents. Yeah, um, you know, so that'll rack up the royalties. <laughs> yeah, that will. <laughs> well, I, you know, obviously it's something they're doing to help. Yeah, write, but I, I, I no, no. That. But you've got a, you've got an essay in here. Uh, Mercedes Yardley, Jack Ketchum, Tim Wagner, and others have essays in here. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you write for that book? Just briefly. Well, I, I probably what's out now is an om is the omnibus edition. Um, it was originally uh, four uh, four shorter things that then put together. Um, so I was in the I was asked to do something for the first one, and I we could I far as I know we pr pretty much had uh, the freedom to do whatever we, we wanted to, and 
so um what i wanted to write about was um well it was uh, 11 what do you i'm blanking on the title though the, kind of the subtitle was 11 11 signposts for going all the way uh let's see here i've got the amazon page in front of me yeah uh, the infrastructure of the gods. The infrastructure of the gods. Yeah. Was for going all the way. Yeah. Um, essay, yeah. And I, what I did ended up being double the length that he was asking for. So he <laughs> split it into. Two. Yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> um, so I see split it into, and uh, Joe did, and uh, ran the first half, found a good breaking point in the middle, and ran the first half, and then the second half, and the second volume. So now it's all together, but. I just wanted to write about, uh, and instead of a particular kind of technique or, uh, or, or the thing about characterization or plot structure or anything like that, I wanted to talk about the mindset of what you're doing because I was um, seeing a lot of people doing things that seemed very self-destructive or self-defeating, and so I wanted to uh, kind of get into just talking about good habits and and then. Um, started you know, veering off toward then the things that I was seeing that the people were doing just to completely self sabotage themselves, and so that was that was really um, kind of advice from the trenches from uh, for for keeping on the path really because you know, you you see people do stupid things in social media that ends up getting them reviled. Um, not to say that they wouldn't uh they're not maybe they're not very stable individuals to begin with but uh or some of them that to start issuing death and rape threats because they get uh they get uh, a rejection um but other other times some people do stuff that's just in the heat of the moment say that they didn't really consider what they were doing so it's it was just kind of a plea to um I think one thing that I phrase it was, you know, okay, write what you want to get it, then put it away until the next day, then delete yeah, exactly. all, yeah, then to then delete all the uh, all the exclamation points uh, and, and instances of the word cocksucker, you know. You know, um, and 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 a lot of it is repetitive behavior on some writers and editors' part. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not the extreme threats or anything like that, but it's just. Uh, you know, it's stuff you sort of get sick of of, of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, any comments on this, Kelly Young? I know you have a comment. Now say that again. I was looking up what was going over here. Pay <laughs> attention, for God's sake! What's go What's going on? Where? <laughs> the thing is, if you just treated it like you were having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody, right? With the realization that whatever you do on the internet is permanent, it mm. never never goes away unless it's your Kindle edition that you paid money for. You know? <laughs> well, but, yeah, are we. I mean, I guess what I Ryan want to know was is talking what, about for those of you who were asleep, <laughs> Mister Young. I need another. This drink. is exactly one of the reasons you gave me when I asked you earlier today. Why do you like Brian Hodge okay. so much as a person? <laughs> I wasn't sure if we were going to jump into ST Joshi territory here or not. Oh, I, no. <laughs> I hope not, but yeah. Yeah, what I appreciate is that, uh, you know, it, especially it seems in the Lovecraft circle, we seem to get a lot of people who are, um, I don't, I don't want to say whiners and complainers, but maybe that's exactly what I want to say. Online, they use Facebook as their place to just kind of dump all of their feelings. And... Brian does not do that. Brian will promote his work and then he'll talk about stuff going on and you get a general positive vibe from Brian. And I think that that's what, a, you know, whether or not that's how he's really feeling, that's what a professional person should be <laughs> setting out there. You don't want to, you don't want to make your place a downer for your readers. No. And I, I really appreciate that, that you don't do that. Well, I tend to be fairly optimistic by nature to begin with. I mean, not that, yeah, I wasn't shy about talking of the challenges of this year. Um, no, but I never got the feeling that. that it was a uh, poor me no, conversation. Um, but I'm just not interested in putting that out there. I'm not interested in indulging that in myself and wallowing in that in, in, either. Um, and I, you know, I'm not interested in fighting trolls. Um, 
I, you know, I, that's just not, that's just not how I want to conduct myself. And, and I, the thing that I feel, even people that I really like, um, I'll see them wade into these battles. And that's, that's something that I get into in the, the essay that you're talking there. They may even be going into these things good heartedly. And, um, um, and, and, and for the right reasons, but you're not going to convince anybody that they, you're not going to convince assholes to change their mind. Exactly. Um, because they've got an, an, probably a part of their identity invested in, in, in cruelty. Um, I know what you mean. I've never been able to change Kelly's mind about yeah. anything. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, they'll wade attention. into these, they wade into these battles and then you'll see that the, the the toll hours later that they're feeling demoralized and beaten down. They're, they're saying, Oh, I've got to get off of here for, for days. I'm going to go away for a week. You know? Well, these are self-inflicted wounds uh, to, to, to an extent. Right. You're, you're, if you're standing, if you put yourself in the line of fire against somebody who, who enjoys um, trying to tear you down, you know, they, they got no stakes in this. You do. Uh, at least if you're a, a, at least if you're a professional and uh, yeah, and, that, uh, I see this so much I, that I, I see this so much that I wonder that some people are on so much that I wonder how, how they find any time to write or, yeah. or be an editor or a publisher or whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah. On Facebook having these discussions so much. Yeah. And but, it's all so ephemeral. It's, um, Going back to the David Lee Roth line about impermanence, here today, gone later today. Yeah, the, it just scrolls out of sight so quickly. Um, well, the name of that book, and I, you know, again, this is great that Crystal Lake Publishing did this. I mm -hmm. think it's about three years old. Uh, I don't know if there's a volume two, but this is called, uh, the title of this is Writers on Writing, Volume One, An Author's Guide, available for Kindle only, it looks like, for, for zero dollars. Uh, and again, it's you know essay from Brian Hodge. Jack oh, is it, oh, is it just the others. first the first volume then? It's not the omnibus. It's I don't know that, but it it, it says volume one. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I thought that that uh, that the full four pack was uh, was the only thing that was available now. I'll have to look in the. In yeah, the they they might be offering just that first volume as a as a free teaser. Ah. Uh, well, that could that's be a heck of a teaser. That's great. Taste of crack, you know. First one's free. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gateway drug. To yeah. <laughs> since, <laughs> since we're going over titles, I looked up "Shadow Over Main Street" and it's the short story was the stagnant the breath stagnant change. breath of change. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. I didn't. I didn't say it. I, I told I was telling where it was from. And uh, it's superbly written. You use. Um, Really, mainly one Lovecraftian deity. There's a, yeah. there's a there's a little subtle reference to another, but without even really mentioning their uh, their names. Yeah, it's about a town with sort of some residents have called something up that they shouldn't have. Yeah, it was about um, for that one. I got to thinking in terms of well, why. Why is there such uh, burnished nostalgia for for this era in the first place? And especially when you're kind of glossing over things like racism, uh, sexism, um, sexual assault, things like that, that tends to get buried um, as long as the right people are doing it and have the have the privilege to get get away with it. And so I got to thinking of it. Well, what? how much would these guys have wanted to keep the town just the way it was in an era of, of rampant change? So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the bargain that they struck to keep everything the same. Anyone else have questions for Brian? Ben, you have a question? about uh, whom the gods yeah. would I was curious when whom the gods would destroy is being reprinted. I know you guys talked about it earlier, but uh, now I'm bravely interested. I'd like to read it. I I can't say really. Like I said, um, it's it's been a weird year. That's uh, that uh, everything had to get pushed back because of uh, 
the, the family stuff and the executor duties and that's just not on my immediate you know in a few months i might be i might be uh cleared up enough here to uh to start tending to those things again the way i uh the way i was moving them forward at the beginning of the year but it's it's kind of like i'm gonna have to figure out where i was in the process all over again and um and yeah, that's so, understandable. So we, we know about your upcoming single author collection yeah um do you have any upcoming anthology appearances that you can tell us about um yeah i had a i think it should be out in november it's called pop the clutch um it's a kind of a a rockabilly inspired horror anthology but i had a whole lot of fun with that um uh called i was a teenage shroom fiend uh that involves uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms uh that uh that was it was kind of inspired by a line of a, an early biography of the band the cramps about them mutating in television light um so that uh that was something that i, I did um a little over a year ago it's, it's going to be out in december or uh, november i think um that's that's the only one that i'm that i'm thinking of right off the top of my head anybody else have a question yeah oh, i you wanted to ask him about a barry manilow song didn't you that's right <laughs> i think i think everyone who wants to see mandy has probably seen mandy yeah and so yeah. brian i was hoping you could to tell everybody who's listening your theory on what's going on with Nicolas Cage in that film because when I first read it on your page I was kind of like what and then you kind of explained it and I am totally in on on your thoughts on this movie now uh, is this spoilerific well that's why I it's said I think have everyone to be. wants to yeah. well okay so just if, if you haven't seen Mandy turn your ears away for two minutes yeah you know so all right yeah go ahead Brian okay well my my train of thought started when he took that huge knife through the ribs. Uh, is that, that is not a wound that he could have shaken off, um, as though it were not not even a factor in anything that, that that came after that. So I got to thinking, okay, well, what's really going on here? What is it with his? So I got to thinking, well, what? And I I watched it again the second night just to to, to see how how it held up. Um, with, with what I was thinking of. So I got to wondering if he wasn't some sort of demigod that was, uh, that had chosen this secluded woodland life with this beguiling mortal woman. Um, and the, the things that, that, and specifically a son of, uh, a son or grandson or whatever of Jupiter. And so I, you know, the clues are there. Um, she, Early on in that conversation about the planets, she tells him that her favorite planet is Jupiter. They come back around to that really toward the end when he meets the chemist, the guy who's been brewing up those uh, hallucinogens. And when he walks in down that corridor, the guy refers to him as a Joven warrior, with Jove being another, uh, another name for Jupiter. So by then, he's already uh, really in full vengeance mode. Um, but then there's that that section where he forges his own really wild acts but it's like uh yeah he he creates the, he's obviously has created the sand mold to pour uh to pour <laughs> the molten metal into he's really taking a lot of time to go on a killing spree or moving quickly his, uh, <laughs> yeah um and moving as though that wound is no longer a problem at all. Some people have, have thought, well, he's he was just drugged up. Well, he hasn't gotten the drugs at that point. Uh, um, so, so what you've got then is a scene of metalworking, fire, uh, smithery. Um, well, Vulcan was another was another son of Jupiter, and that's so that's a, a very Vulcan-like scene with. Uh, with him forging that axe and the metalwork and the smith and the, the fire and and all that, so yeah, I so I tend to think he's it's it's what it really is is this kind of heavy metal mythologized story of a of a demigod coming into his own, um, 
coming into his own powers or reclaiming them or something like that because by the end he's he can crush a head easier than the mountain <laughs> on uh, on uh, on Game of Thrones and he's got and he's smaller and has no leverage against the ground so he just does it with his hands and and does refer to himself as a god at that point so okay now now I have to watch this movie I wasn't going to before ah! I cannot imagine you liking this movie, Mike. Oh, really? Yeah, you're just well, not going to like it. But okay. I, I watched it then a second time after you had floated this out here, Brian. Yeah. And I was just like, I am 100% sold on this theory. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Um, I didn't see anything in the, on, the, on the second watching that that did anything other than, than reinforce it, really. I didn't see anything that eroded it. So, so yeah. that's, that's what works for me. Um, uh, the uh, I don't know if there's going to be any kind of director's commentary on the uh, on the upcoming DVD or the upcoming Blu-ray Blu-ray release, but I'll be interesting to to, to hear what uh, what he has to say. Any yeah. other questions for Brian, guys? Before we let him go, uh, I always like to ask every writer this, Brian. What do you consider success as a writer to be? What 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 does that mean to you personally? <sighs> I don't know. I probably would have answered at different d different times at different stages, but uh, I just think having the uh, if, if, if first on one level, just just connecting with people and have people respond to what you're to, to what you're doing and being able to get it out there. Of course, anybody can get something out there now. That wasn't the case always before, but uh, so you're always in control of that. But as far as having people really get it and and wait for something next, and then. Uh, it's always good to have the autonomy to to, to keep doing it and, and to keep uh, to have the you know, to have it uh, pay for itself really to, to be able to keep doing it. Um, but ultimately, I, I think it, I think it comes down to just a feeling like uh, the highest thing really is, is creative satisfaction because um, I've I've seen a lot of people that. Uh, that are on this kind of treadmill where they're, where they're trying to do a novel a month and they can maintain that for a while, but they end up hating what they loved. Um, to, 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 just to, to, to try to keep up this financial treadmill that, uh, um, and feeding this instant gratification that, that their readers expect out of them. They're not really interested in quality. They're interested in, in, uh, qu in quantity and frequency and, and then, you know these people end up seeming to really want off uh, off this machine that they've created. Like I said, they've started. You know, after a few years, they've started hating what they what they used to love to do, just because they have they don't feel like they can recharge. Yeah. Well, Brian, thanks for being on the show. Okay, really thank you. you again. So. Yeah. Be careful driving out and all that snow. Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't have to. I don't have to go anywhere. It's going to melt tomorrow. It's going to be in the forties tomorrow. So. Oh, okay. so, so please keep us informed about that uh, TV po series possibility. Yeah, be, well, yeah. These, these these things move slowly. Um, I remember at the time that uh, that this first got started going. I uh, I read. Uh, I was reading David Morell's book, uh, memoir, and, and 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 kind of writing advice book and. Uh, it was kind of mixed all those. Things. But he was talking about an early film deal that he had that had that took eighteen months to to negotiate, and <laughs> and I thought, oh, please not me, please not me, please. Yeah, yeah. It took a year and a half. <laughs> a lot of respect for David Morrell. Um, yeah, he's a, he he admitted that uh, his novel First Blood, uh, he 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 liked the changes they made in the film, and that was something as a veteran I really appreciated. Um, but he was able wow. to look back at one of his most popular works and realize some flaws in it. It's impressive. Oh, and okay. What what did he? Well, what's what did uh, he like? So in I don't know if you ever read the novel of First Blood. I did. But yeah. Rambo kills everyone. Right? Indiscriminately. Kills, yeah. Yeah, and um, he liked that in the movie they made him the sympathetic character that he's just a veteran. He doesn't really understand what's going on. And he's trying to defend himself and. Yeah. Um, the climate at the time was so bad towards people that served in the military. You kind of look back and realize that that wasn't really the best thing to do with that story. Yeah. Um, so as a veteran, it was so impressive to see him actually make a statement like that and admit that, well, you know, the movie handled it much more 
there is no good guy in this situation. It was two people in a bad situation. Mm. But Rambo wasn't, you know, just because he's a veteran doesn't make him an indiscriminate killer. And yeah. I, I really appreciated that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I had never heard of uh, Morell making that statement, but that's, that's a cool thing to see that he could reassess and, and realize that, well, the movie couldn't have been made that way. That was, they, they would have, <laughs> they would have lost the audience immediately. You know? So, yeah, I think their hands were tied there, but just to see him respond to it. Well, that's cool. Well, thanks Brian for being on the show. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me again. With you, as thanks, always. Brian. Okay. And, um, hope to see you soon. We'll do. All right. Thanks, bud. You bet. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Brian. You, Brian. Well, he's always so great to talk with. What a neat guy. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder: we've got we do a Halloween show every year. Uh, this year it's on October the twenty eighth, uh, Sunday. So it's at uh, two weeks from now. With Scott Thomas and Jeff Thomas. So that's always a good time. Um, my life is complete now because I have seen Venom. So, you saw Venom? I saw Venom, yeah. Oh, please. Look, look, spill look, it. Look, see it. It, it was, I liked it. It was good. Yeah, I saw it too. I liked it too. Are you, why are you so surprised that I saw Venom? I just didn't think that that this was your kind of character or film. I haven't I seen thought, it yet. I thought it was funny. Yeah. Was it supposed to be? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think so. There's a debate over that with critics, but it, it worked. You know, it's interesting, too. Ben and I were talking about this in the latest Patreon podcast. It's got, what, a Rotten tomato score of 31%, but the movie going public, almost everyone who sees it loves it. I saw it today. It was sold out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and it's the top of the box office again this weekend. It just yeah. shows you how worthless, more and more worthless Rotten Tomatoes is getting. I was I was listening. To, I was on the road a lot today, and the radio was going. It's like Pete. Yeah. He showed up. <laughs> and and yeah, now everything is echoing. Look, look at the hair, man. Mike, you have the longest hair on the panel. Thank you. It's my winter cut. Anyway, um, the the. The radio, the guys are like, yeah, and against all odds and critic opinions, Venom topped the list at the box office again this weekend. And it's just, it's, you know, somebody got something really, really wrong about this movie. And it's not the film, it's apparently the critics. So Mike and I went into great detail on this on a podcast episode that everyone should become a Patreon and go listen to. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this seems like a repeat to me of Suicide Squad. It's Critics just blow the thing apart because it doesn't fit what they think their audience of readers as critics want to read or want to see in the films. And uh, I, I saw the film. Mike saw the film. Rick saw the film. It's, it's pretty fun. Did you just compare it to Suicide Squad in a positive way? Yes, I like Suicide Squad. Uh, I didn't like You're Suicide dead to me. Squad. You're dead to me. <laughs> that, that was the biggest by, turd that came out that year. By the way, yeah. you can become a patron just by Googling Lovecraft using Patreon and clicking on the link. Uh, but uh, I would say the, the movie is not still, the... Are, wait a minute. Are we still echoing, Kelly, or are we fine? W was this Pete's fault? It was Pete's fault. You're fine. Okay. Okay. All right. Like everything else. The, the movie is it's not the greatest superhero film, but it does what it has to do work. Like I've heard some complaints that the villain isn't, you know, the villain is he's not bad. He's not fantastic, but he's good enough for the plot. The thing that makes it is uh, Tom Hardy and his performance as both Venom and Eddie Brock. And what was weird about this movie, this was the first movie where I was telling Mike before the podcast, I liked personally better. Uh, you know, I, I've, I, I've read things as easy as where I've liked him as a villain, which means I hated him as a character. I mean, you know, I, 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 not that I hated the depiction, but, you know, he's an evil guy. Uh, I, I think Venom is cool in this movie with his uh, yeah, it was just It was just a fun popcorn movie. It was very, it was very enjoyable. A buddy you know, film. By art or anything, but 
the review I heard was that it was the second best film that had Venom in it. No, it is. It the, is uh, way, oh. Venom is handled way better than he was. All right. It's, yeah, that, no, that's definitely not true. Yeah, is like this I said, better, I, guys? Yes, we, we. There's no echo. Plus, you look adorable. I, I also hear a lot of complaints about the uh, female character, and she does something pretty cool in the movie. Yeah. 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 There's complaints about the female character. There's a complaint that uh, she's too much of a damsel in distress. But I movie. don't think, I mean, maybe I'm misremembering. I don't remember her being a damsel in distress at any point in the film. In fact, yeah, I don't. Yeah, remember. yeah, she isn't. She's never, she's never really rescued by Venom. In no, fact, it's the other Eddie way around. Brock rescues yeah. Eddie, Eddie Brock. Yeah, twice. Twice. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, that argument is. I, I think what happens is a lot of these reviewers, and and a lot of online fans, they're like, you know, Venom should be in the MCU. This is ridiculous. I'm gonna hate this movie no matter what. Um, it reminds me in some ways of the the Tarzan movie that came out last year, or the year before, where everyone just attacked the concept of Tarzan. No one actually saw the film to attack. So a lot of their criticisms about characters in the film, it's like, well, that was true if you read the the novels from the 1910s. But it wasn't true about the film you were watching. And I think with Venom, um, the character's name is Anne. If I, Anne or Annie, I can't remember. She's fantastic. She help, She saves him several times. She's the only one helping him figure things out. I, I can't understand that idea. Yeah. If, if you want a, a good uh, assessment of the movie, and you can see it only after you've seen the movie, because it spoils one thing, on uh, YouTube... Watch Mojo had the five things Venom got right that critics are overlooking, and she was one of them. Um, Kelly, how was the HP Lovecraft Film Festival last weekend? Oh my God! Uh, what I can remember, it, it was a blast. I only got to see a couple of films because I was spending it schmoozing mostly. I spent a lot of time with Philip. I spent too little time with Matthew, but I'm sure he disagrees with that. He was avoiding you. <laughs> Um, the yeah, I was highlight going to the film festival. <laughs> the highlight for me, and I don't know about Matthew, was seeing this little J-pop metal band from Japan that showed up and sang uh, this adorable, or uh, an entire set of adorable songs about the coming apocalypse, and it was uh, it was surprisingly good. It was so much fun. It, it, you couldn't even begin to describe it if you saw them performing without the translation. They, sh they sounded like they were singing sappy Japanese love songs. Yes. But then they put the lyrics up there, and it's like, the Wind Walker is coming. He will smash you. Yes, it was all very, very – it was ripped right from Lovecraft stories. So I, I'll, I'll bet that they are not writing their lyrics. <laughs> well, there, there's a whole thing about um, – there are these – there's this big market in Japan, I suppose in the U.S. too, but like – there will be these very young and pretty girls. They come on the scene for a few years. They're all the rage uh, and they get a lot of airplay and they sell a lot of CDs and then they fade right away. And then the next group of uh, barely teenage girls comes on and, and fills that niche. So I don't know if they're anything like that. But there's a, a long history in Japanese pop music of that kind of thing. Right. I sh we should mention they are called Necronomidol. Necronom idol idol and uh all of their song lyrics and song titles are lovecraftian songs uh strange eons was my favorite and the lyrics were just so bleak and disturbing <laughs> and the song is so catchy <laughs> so it's, it's, it's it sounds like a cosmic horror it sounds like a cheerful <laughs> song until you hear the lyrics do you know what the lyrics are yeah, yeah it's, i, it's, I I turned over to my buddy Eric that we were both bopping our head and I was like, good lord, the apocalypse has never been so adorable. Uh, Mark Borman from Australia uh, sent me an email. Hi Mike and the gang, given how much you all love Halloween and autumn, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on Halloween and the Southern Hemisphere. Mark is from Australia. 
As an Aussie kid in the 80s, I'd often ask my parents and other adults why we couldn't celebrate Halloween. The polite version of what I'd often be told was that the American, American traditions had no place in Australia. Uh, thankfully, Halloween has gradually taken hold here and seems to get bigger every year. I sometimes wonder if we are missing out on the full experience, though. It's spring here, and, tre and trees are starting to grow new leaves. The weather is getting warmer and the days longer. It's a time of growth and renewal. By the time Halloween arrives, it will be daylight savings, and people will be getting around in shorts and T-shirts. How would your Halloween experience change if you had to celebrate it in spring rather than autumn? Do you see Halloween and autumn as being inseparable? I'm all for Halloween in Australia, but maybe we should be celebrating it in April instead. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the podcast. Your podcast is a highlight of my week, and I am ever thankful for how much you all give to the show. P.S. Uh, except for Kelly Young. Um, he did not write that. I, I, did, I made up that last You know, if, if Halloween was in East, it would be, well, Pergus Day. Yeah. I mean, in April. Yeah, well, you know, I, you know, even people in the Northern Hemisphere can, can, can feel this you know if you live in a place like texas or florida or i don't know southern california or the the desert or what you know whatever southern united states uh i'm from iowa and right now i live in texas and yeah the experience is is 100 not the same you know if it's 80 degrees on halloween night i i i'm just not feeling it so, we have to we actually have to plan around shedding the costume because it's just going to get too hot. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so in LA, um, it, depending on the year, it can be 50 degrees outside or it can be close to a hundred. Um, so yeah, that's something like my son wears these really thick onesies because kids these days are spoiled and have really nice costumes that actually look real. And, um, we, we actually trick or treat in South Pasadena near where the actual Halloween house is, um, which is a law offices now that they don't decorate in any way. So don't make the trip just for that, despite the new film. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's weeks we've there's uh, years we've gone where my son is walking around in this big warm onesie and then just starts crying. And it's like, OK, let's stop. Let's go back to the house. We'll change. We'll go out, back out trick or treating. It, it changes it. Yeah. Well, if you'll recall, last year we didn't. I didn't get to go to the film festival because, and we didn't ha really have a Halloween because of the hurricane. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I miss fall in autumn. Uh, it might be a little cooler than normal in Texas this fall, but then again, it might not. Uh, today I got up to eighty. Cold fronts moving in tomorrow. The high is supposed to be fifty. That's that's pretty chilly for October in Texas. Uh, so by October 31st, it might be up there in the 70s and 80s again. But yeah, heck, if I lived in Australia and, and I actually got a in, an autumn in April or so, so, you know, in March and April, I would, yeah, I'd just make up my own Halloween and do it then. <laughs> Name it something else. But, you know, the thing is, Halloween is about the separation between, it, it, not the only thing it's about, but one of the things it's about is the separation between, you know, the light part of the year and the darker part of the year, you know, the oncoming of winter. Well, if you're, you know, and you're, if you're on the land down under, the darker part of your year is coming up. So I would say, yeah, that has everything to do with Halloween. You know, the uh, in the United Kingdom, the closest thing to Halloween is Guy Fawkes uh, Day. Yeah, where they burn uh, Guy Fawkes in effigy, and I was just looking up. They don't celebrate that in Australia either. Hmm. Yeah, but you know that Australia, I think, celebrates Christmas in July as a separate holiday from Christmas. Just like really? I didn't know that. Anybody know if I'm wrong? I I've seen this in a couple films where they celebrate Christmas, but because Christmas is in summer, they also celebrate something called Christmas in July because that's when they get snow. Um, I, I guess I view Halloween, the celebration is, what really makes it fun for me is the young people. So, like, I have my memories of Halloween in Ohio where it was cold and chilly and the leaves were turning and there's apple cider and stuff. 
but my sons were raised in Texas and Mississippi. And it's really just, uh, if the neighborhood went out of their way, they put up decorations and the kids went out trick or treating and you, you think your costumes around uh, what the temperature is gonna be, it was still a blast for them. You know, there was still like the rumor of the one house that gave out full sized candy bars. And <laughs> then my kids were talking about the one house, this is in San Antonio, where no one goes because there's this big dog that'll chase you. You know, it's like, it, it was just they had their own stories around the neighborhood kind of like we did but when they went out trick-or-treating all their they would run into their friends and had a great time so i don't know that the temperature makes as much of a difference as uh, the atmosphere that is created in the place where you're celebrating it i, I agree that's part of it but i'll go ahead and say that the rest of what you're saying i, I agree with what you're saying the atmosphere is is totally you know, if a neighborhood's celebrating Halloween, it, it makes a, it, it's a lot different than a neighborhood that's not. But um, that being said, I wrote about this in the introduction to Autumn Cthulhu. You know, uh, it's funny, I'm in Texas now because I was born in Texas and lived here till age six. And then I grew up in Iowa, you know, so I, I, I'm pretty much, and I was there for, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, so I consider myself a northerner. Um, when I, what I wrote in the introduction to Autumn Cthulhu was the short version is that when I experienced Halloween for the first time up in Iowa, you know, the temperature and the leaves on the ground and all that, it, it was a massively different experience. And that's when I really fell in love with, with Halloween and Autumn. So that's my take on it. If I, you know, and like I said, if you're in Australia, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, your darker part of the year is about to start, you know, on April the 30th. So maybe maybe April 30th should be a Australian Halloween. So, well, um, uh, yeah, Kelly, it, right, go ahead, Rick. It's fine. Oh, that's what I say. Uh, Pete is correct that uh, Australians celebrate Christmas in the summer. Well, uh, well then that's oh, and, 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 and in our <laughs> summer. Yeah. It's their winter. So, I mean, if you really look at it, Christmas is where it is because of the winter solstice. It's not because anybody figured out that Jesus was born at that time. Well, so, yeah. Like, you, it, it would be the equivalent of their winter solstice. Well, yeah, if he existed, he wasn't born on December 25th. It would be more like October. Right. So, what were you going to say, Kelly? I was going to say, if you're, if you're living there all your life in Australia and you're just raised that this is when Halloween is and it happens to take place, you know, in a hot part of the town. I don't, or a hot, hot part of the, hot part of the year. I don't think that, uh, that that's as big a deal as us who have been raised with, I, I think that we're all just, you know, since we were kids, Halloween has always taken place when the leaves are falling, all of that stuff. And so you're raised with that and you don't think that you could possibly have it any other way. But if you're raised when the sun is still out at 930 at night and that's when your Halloween is, I could see how you could get past it. Halloween as as celebrating the time, the difference between light turning to dark and all that stuff, it's gotten so far away from being what that's about now. Here in the U.S., it's about putting on costumes and getting candy. That's all it's about anymore. Yeah, well, that's all it's about to, to a lot of people. But for people who are really into, like me, autumn and Halloween, it's about the mood and the atmosphere of that year, of that time of year. You know, I, and I don't disagree with what you're saying, that if you've grown up this way, maybe that's all you know and you're fine with it. On the other hand, maybe you've seen a lot of Halloween and autumns in movies and, and you know, movies like Trick or Treat or... You know, John Carpenter's Halloween, I think even though it was summer, he went out of his way to make it look like autumn, sure. leaves sure. everywhere and all that. I, I will tell you, I, I am weary of perpetual summer. <laughs> it's only worse. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, Mark, I hope that uh, hope that's a good answer. And, and thanks for what you said about this being one of the highlights of your week. I appreciate that. I've actually gotten several emails like that lately and it uh really keeps me going so comments like like that are really welcome uh if you want to send me a comment like that it's lovecrafteasing at gmail.com 
if you hate the show, uh, the, just send an email to uh, Kelly. What's your email address again? KL Young at I don't give a fuck dot com. <laughs> All right. Haunting of Hill House. No spoilers. I've learned my lesson. I don't know how I did that yesterday to you, Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I've only seen the first episode. I, I thought it was a very slow episode, but I thought it was very beautiful looking, and I'm looking forward to it winding out. So the the first thing I will say, and then I'll get into my main beef. And it, please, anyone else, jump in. But it has nothing to do with the haunting of Hill House. This could be labeled something else and be the exact same story. That was I agree. my complaint when it first came out. When I saw that first trailer, I was like, oh, couldn't we have called this something else and then still held out hope for a nice Haunting a Hill House adaptation? But right, because now you've removed that. Something I felt is the, even the idea that you, they would use it for marketing. I mean, just being Netflix's first horror series is marketing enough. I don't think anyone is watching the show because they were fans of the Sh Shirley Jackson novel. And if they were... They're really angry, and they didn't make it through the first episode. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I say that. I love that first episode. I love the ending. I thought the whole thing was well-structured. I haven't finished the series yet. I, I really enjoyed it. I think it's great. I just wish they'd called it anything else. How many episodes have you seen so far, Ben? I am two and a half episodes in. Okay, anybody else watched it yet? Okay, I think the first nine episodes are, are are really, really good. And I think watching the series for the ending of episode five alone it is worth it. The ending of episode five, Kelly, Ben, you guys, you'll have to tell me about it, or anyone listening, send me an email. You'll have to tell me what you think about it when you get there. But the ending of episode five is just fantastic. Um... And, you know, six through nine are good, too. And then episode 10, you know, we'll, we'll do a Patreon podcast ever after everybody's seen it. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my when we can do it with spoilers. And I'll tell you why I'm so pissed off at episode 10. I mean, it, it offended me. It was so bad. Oh, boy. And I don't really feel that strongly about most things like this. It pulled a Castle Rock is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was it was it's worse than that because Castle Rock. I didn't think Castle Rock was all that good throughout. A Haunting of Hill House series is very good. Episodes one through ten. You know, it, it, with keeping in mind with what Kelly said, it's a little bit of a slow start, but that's okay. You know, your character building and all that. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I mean, I think I thought I watched nine hours of great TV. What happened? You know, this is my payoff. This last hour is my payoff. This this payoff is not worth it. I will so. say I love I love the casting. I think the cast looks that both the the young versions and the old versions yeah. they seem to, they look like they're grown up kids. And I love the um, all the daughters of the the mom Carla um, Cugino, I think is her name. How it's pronounced? Yeah, they all look like her. I've never seen a a cast that where they tried to match that up so well. Oh gosh! If just completely unrelated, have you ever watched the Long Riders, the the, the Western movie? Because they have three sibling, three sets of siblings playing the sets of siblings in the history of Jesse James. Um, you know they have the Keeches, they have the Quades, um, one other one, the Carradines. If you want to see what it should look like when you do it right. Um, that's the movie to watch. I, I just ordered it right now. <laughs> I have a lot of That's Jesse James films. So it's, as soon as you started talking about it, I went on Amazon and clicked it. Click. Okay. Um, Doctor Who. Rick, you want to you wanna give your thoughts on the new Doctor Who? I like the female Doctor. I think she did a nice tribute to David Tennant in the first episode. We'll see if uh, the character takes on different uh, dimensions and tonight. Yeah, soon, right? An hour. It's going to be. It's going to be on at eight o'clock my time, so it's mm -hmm. about a half hour. 
Well, I don't watch it live, as you know. I don't have cable, so I, I watch it on Amazon the next day. Um, but yeah, I liked it too. I liked it a lot. Um, I liked what she said at the end. You know, I'm just a traveler. I see things that need fixing, fixing, and I fix them. Yeah. So, uh, I didn't know what to expect, and whatever expectations I had were definitely exceeded. Um, I thought it was a very good episode. I'll and tell I you, what, think she makes a great doctor. Yes. One one thing. This is the first time as a companion who I identify with. Graham. You have somebody our age, or at least my age. Joe, <laughs> Joe and I can identify him if Joe was here. Uh, okay, on to other things. DC Universe. Uh, did anyone get that? Did anyone see the first episode of Titans? I did. What would you think? I didn't get DC Universe. I went to my uh, buddies right down the street who's got DC Universe and told me that I should probably come and watch it. And I did, and I fucking loved it. I did too. <laughs> I was, I was a little blown away by how much I loved it. Actually, <laughs> the, the only negative I'll give is they didn't credit Marv Wolfman, um, which I think is a little bit of a, a downer. I, I agree, it's fantastic. I, it, c- considering what we saw in the trailer, this was priceless. Yeah. The only negative I'll give, and it's not much of a negative because I like the actor. I like his work. He's a he's a great Robin, but I'm thinking he's a little young to be a detective. Police officer, get, yeah. I didn't get why he was a detective. I mean, for story purposes, I got it, but I was like, is this something that has happened in the comics that no, I didn't? No, no, no. Yeah, okay, not, not that I recall. I, so, no, I watched. That. He's never. In, in fact, when Robin moves away from Batman, he becomes this. Robin Dick Grayson, he becomes Nightwing, and he's in a town called Bloodhaven, right? Which is, uh, you know, I don't know, an hour south of Gotham or something like that. It's the yeah. New Jersey of the DC universe. Yeah, but that happens about forty issues into the New Teen whoa, Titans series. Whoa, 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 whoa! Series, New Jersey so. of the DC universe. Oh First boy! Of all, Gotham <laughs> and Metropolis are in Delaware. Well, Gotham would be Chicago, wouldn't it? I think they're all on the East Coast. Yeah, so Gotham is literally another word for New York, and Gotham was always written to be a New York analog. Yeah, so Gotham Metropolis. City. Very gothic. New York. And so when they created Bloodhaven, the idea is Bloodhaven would be about as far away as New Jersey. I'm not. I don't want to. Uh, my wife's from New York, so I, I want to be very careful what I say here. But uh, that's generally how they how the writers treat it. Well, wait a second. New York. I was, thought that Metropolis was New York's for, was the New York stand-in in DC. Well, actually, believe it or not, Metropolis was originally a Cleveland stand-in. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so apparently, in the 1930s, Cleveland was like a nice place to visit. I don't know, but if you actually go back to the old issues, uh, the Daily Planet is at one point a Cleveland newspaper. Um, they forget that they're supposed to be in Metropolis, and then I think. DC sort of treats it as like a Chicago-ish, sometimes New York analog. But I, um, Marvel and DC did a big crossover miniseries, uh, JLA Avengers, and they made a point that the DC Earth is actually larger to fit these extra gigantic cities in. It's, oh my God! It can't I'm not making worse. this up. Well, when Cleveland was in the 30s, it was uh, it had as its equivalent of a police commissioner, Elliot Ness. That's where he went to after the Untouchables. Well, the interesting thing about Bloodhaven is you, you, we all know how bad Gotham is supposed to be. You know, uh, Bloodhaven is worse. So, if that tells you anything about Bloodhaven, could they have borrowed the detective angle on Robin from uh, the Dark Knight films? I kind of wondered if that's where they were maybe going. I don't know. All I know is this guy's this kid's a great actor. He he does he's doing a great job, but he looks pretty young to be a detective. You know. Yeah, well I thought he made a great Robin. I thought I mean I thought that this had Zack Snyder's stink all over it as far as the look of it, but 
it also worked for me. Jeez, this thing looked like a million bucks. I was like, well, I don't yeah, know what the budget yeah. is for this show, but it is. It and is Jeff a Johns. Budget. We're not getting echoes anymore, are we? No. Uh, Jeff Johns okay. got his little dig in with. He doesn't like Batman, so you know having Robin say "fuck Batman" was, I'm sure, all Jeff Johns. Ah, uh, I didn't realize he didn't like Batman. Well, but Who he can't like ignore Batman? Batman because, as Ben told me the other day, Batman is about 25 percent of DC sales. Oh yeah. I, I well, I mean, it. it's it's more it's 25 percent of DC's books. Batman is literally the title that the comic industry measures sales on. So if you go look at the monthly sales and you see numbers like 1.8 or 0.79, that's what percentage of a title sold compared to Batman. Holy shit. I didn't know I'm, that. Yeah, I'm not making this up. So the Batman title, not Batman Detective. Batman or Detective? Specific, Batman specifically. Okay. It's always in like the top five historically since they started tracking this stuff. Batman is always the measure Everything else is judged on, literally. Yeah. And it was almost canceled in the early 60s. Fascinating. I, I do know that DC stands for Detective Comics, so that's obviously the foundation of their company. And if you're wondering why, it used to be too kid-oriented. We had, you know, Batmite, Batwoman, a different I, Batgirl, Batdog. The Batdog, yeah. I watched... I watched Titans last night with Logan, my son, and we had to rewind that first fight scene with Robin and those thugs. It was so awesome. And I was like, man, this, this kid is fast. You well, know? and I, I, watching it, I was like, I wish that uh, Cloak and Dagger had, had paid as much attention to their storyline, what they were doing. This made me feel very much like I wanted to know more about everybody. And, so, I, and that comes from someone who knew who everybody was supposed to be. So how do we watch this then? Is it on Amazon? No, you've got to get the DC <laughs> Universe app. Oh, for pity's sake. For, uh, for what it's worth? Box or Smart TV. Um, it does have a seven-day free trial. It me, does. Like all That's of them. how I watched it last night, and I was very pleased with it. Um, what else is available on the app? Well, that was the other thing I was going to talk about because there's a lot of comic books available on the app. If you use Comixology, it works exactly the same way. And, you know, for those who say, well, I'm not going to read comics on my TV, that was my first thought. And then, well, wait a minute, the app's available for my, my tablet too. So I downloaded the app to my tablet and I can read all these, you know, free comics uh, on my tablet. So comics are available, series are available, you know, like the old Wonder Woman, all the Superman films, uh, several of the Batman films. They have uh, the remastered Batman the Animated Series in HD, which if yes. you've never seen, it, there's several a lot of fantastic animated episodes. series and films. Um, Super Friends? Yeah, oh. Lois and Clark. Um, you know, there's a lot, yeah. What's, what's the monthly cost? $7.99, I think. Yeah, I'll think about it. I got a buddy right down the street I can just walk to. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been thinking about canceling my cable. So. You still have cable? Well, I have Direct TV, but it's too expensive. No kidding. They, they got rid of uh, being sports, so I can't even watch La Liga anymore. Um. So anyway, yeah, I really liked it. We're getting low on time so i'll cover some of the stuff that i had lined up next week but um let's see here can, can i mention one thing mike sure go ahead okay there is a really cool web comic happening now called welcome to dunwich it's written by gary scott Beatty. uh he has various guest artists like mark bloodworth uh he writes this web comic called gods of azurin azurin and this is like a little foray off of the main story, but it's for free online. Uh, I'll publish a link, and it's really a kind of interesting little story about real estate developers trying to gentrify Dunwich. Uh, okay. Not as all not all is going according to plan. Uh, super, uh, from WeGotThisCovered.com, Supernatural season four. I figured you'd like this, Kelly. Uh, Supernatural season. 14 will play will pay tribute to 80s slasher films so yeah. that's that's not my 
That's yeah. not my jam, as the kids say. That's so, not your jam. I thought no. that was your jam. No, eighties, yes, but slasher films. No, that's not my jam. I, so Friday well, night, there you go. Friday like night, Halloween, I got to see, yeah. I got to see Goosebumps two, Pumpkinhead, and the original Halloween, all on the big screen. Oh, nice. Two of those are really good films. Pumpkinhead is a really good film. Yeah, it's a very yeah. good film. Classic. Um, I'm not sure that Halloween has stood the test of time. How dare you? <laughs> Halloween, Halloween is one of my favorite films. I think the genre has certainly, I mean, it's been imitated so many hundreds yeah. of times. If you see well, a lot of those films. but The impact of the ending is kind of lost because we all have heard of it. But I love the way that film, I mean, so to, uh, I, I literally take my kids trick-or-treating in that neighborhood every year. So there is that impact of, I see a lot of that kind of atmosphere, the way the houses look. Um, that's what Halloween feels like to me. So when I watch that film every year, it, it has an impact to me. I also love the way that the story is constructed. I mean, Michael Myers is one of those classic, I mean, he's like a Dracula. He's he's the quintessential archetype of the slasher. Who drives? That's, well, I mean. Who drives? Before Michael Myers, what did you have to compare him to? There was no Jason. Oh, right? I'm sorry. John Foles, The Collector, was made into a fascinating movie. Psycho. Okay, and you're saying that Norman Bates didn't drive? I don't, no, I don't, I'm not understanding I'm saying, the, I'm saying the problem I have with this film is that we we lock this kid away for what? Is it 15 years? It's longer than that. 17 years, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's 16 years, I think. Something. Yeah. Like that, yeah. And She's then he drops. There's a line of dialogue where they express their own disbelief at that. So I think exactly. that that's accepted as okay. We know this is a little silly. We're moving on. Now, okay, so now well, if he's possessed by the devil, the devil would know how to drive. Or, certainly, he or, would. Or, or, like certainly, demon or whatever. Certainly. And he, he knows how to follow all the street signs, and he just turns on the GPS to get from 150 miles away to Haddonfield. Yes, that that all works because there's a sign that says this way to Haddonfield. Yeah, you know, it's just. But this. I can't believe we're talking about this, but yeah, okay. What I'm just saying with, with a lot of uh, classic movies, if uh, horror movies, especially when they become series, they have a, a very good surprise ending or unexpected ending, yeah. and then we all know it. Yeah. No, just like Psycho is somewhat. You, 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 you're probably going to see Psycho knowing who the murderer is. Yeah, so I my, showed my girls that film, Psycho, about four months ago. And even after they found out that he had killed somebody, well, he only did it for his mother. He was just following, you know, doing what any good boy would do for their mother. And I'm like, what, the, what have I done? What kind of kids have I raised? And, yeah. And then they found out that he was at the end, and they're like, oh, he's not a nice person. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was okay if, if he if he killed women for his mother. Yeah, or, yeah, or, or, or he covered up for his mother. He was, you know. Exactly. Kelly, we're not really gonna talk about this mob thing, are we? <laughs> I mean, it's up to you. I think it's here's. I totally forgot about it until you brought it up today. Honestly, I I, I don't. If you don't want to talk about it, let's not talk about it. I don't care. If you want to talk about it, it's fine. Doctor Who's on in 10 minutes, so, you know, we got to... <laughs> that's, that's a good excuse to have to talk about this. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there are a lot of Stephen King movies coming up. I was going to cover that, too, but I'll save that for next week. Um, oh, can I just mention, then, the yeah. Titans episode that we all seem to love, written by the guy who wrote The Dark Tower last year? Oof. Yeah, I mean, so so bear that in mind. He's got a pretty good track record of fucking things up. So well, no, the dark we, we tower looked to me now. Like so they may have given one guy credit. It looked to me like it was written by a committee. 
Oh, it certainly was, and it was a 10-year project. And it could just be, I doubt very much that Akiva Goldman had read any of the Dark Tower books, and he may be a gigantic DC fan, and that's all it takes. So, Yeah, I will say with friends that are screenwriters, um, a good friend of mine is actually writing Mayans MC. He's the head story writer right now. Um, it's always a committee process, and every writer has something in their their past on IMDb that they wish they could get rid of. So, look yeah. at Akiva's IMDb. I bet you there's a lot he'd he'd like off there. It's it's also how much the director alters it and things like that. Well, next week um, we're going to be talking with Matt Ruff, uh, who we had to reschedule, but uh, he was not feeling well too, so he was actually pretty happy about it. Okay. Um, He's the guy who wrote Lovecraft Country. So that's next week. And then the week after that is the uh, Halloween podcast with Jeff and Scott Thomas. And then uh, Mike Carey, the girl with all the gifts. Oh, neat. Yeah. Thanks, Ben, for putting me in touch with him. Appreciate it. He's a great guy. Um, all right. Well, yeah, if you want to become a patron, like we always say, if you hate this podcast, you'll hate those podcasts even more. Right. Uh, yeah, if possible, if that's possible. They are like the the Gotham. They're they are like the Bloodhaven to Gotham scenario. If if this it, podcast yeah, is Gotham, very apt comparison. Uh, except for the ones you're on, of course, Kelly. Those are always top. Nine. Even even worse. <laughs> All right. Well, just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreons. If you want to email the show, Lovecraft Easy and at gmail.com. Um, uh, am I forgetting anything else? I don't think so. So I think that's it. All right. Go out and watch Doctor Who, everybody. Everyone who has cable, that is. So thanks, guys. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.